Welcome to Contrast. Richard Bennett, converted Catholic priest, now evangelist, presents Contrast. Your comments and questions will be greatly appreciated. Permission is given to record and copy the entire message. And now, here is Richard Bennett. The difficult topic that I address tonight, the topic of legal civil law that the Vatican uses to bring the true gospel into disuse and to bring more and more people onto herself and that she has used in the past to persecute true believers. And I'm going to tie this up with scripture, particularly from Revelation chapter 17. Now I know this is a strong message, it's a message I've never given before, but I think it is absolutely necessary. Even when I was just one year a priest, my very first year where I was a priest in the city of Rome itself, I went out into St. Peter's Square at the end of one of the sessions of Vatican Council II and I saw the square flood with the 3,000 prelates of the church that were flowing out of the Vatican, St. Peter's. And they were dressed in scarlet, the cardinals, and the archbishops and bishops in purple. And even as a Catholic priest, knowing something of the Bible, I had read Revelation 17, I was shocked. It wasn't Hollywood, this was real. I was seeing before my eyes, scarlet and purple, and I knew it wasn't just the Vatican alone, the main cathedral of the Pope is the Lateran and she sits on the seven hills. And I knew something of the civil agreements she had made with nations. And I was shocked, even as a priest, with the little that I knew of the word. And I just put it out of my mind. But there are so few people today willing to speak about this topic that I think it has got to be said, and clearly said, relying on the written clarity of God's word. Lord Acton, one of the most famous of the Roman Catholic historians in history, he declared emphatically that it was through civil agreements that the Vatican made with powers, kings and princes, that in the past she was able for 600 years to torture and bring death upon true believers. A Roman Catholic historian. And she was able to silence the true gospel and bring people to herself. Now it is really sad that in her own day she is again taking civil power onto herself and becoming equipped in law, civil law, in a real distinctive way capable of bringing severe consequences on believers and very few are even aware of it. So I call this presentation, The Vatican Controls Through Civil Law. I begin with a quotation from a European Union business webpage. It's on the internet, eubusiness.com, quotation. Pope John Paul II outlined his dream for a Europe without egotistical nationalism and based on Christian values 
as he received the Charlemagne Prize for his services to Europe at the Vatican Wednesday, March the 24th, 2004. The 83-year-old head of the Roman Catholic Church was chosen for his outstanding life's work promoting European um, understanding in the service of humanity and world peace at a ceremony drawing members of the diplomatic community and officials from Aachen, a German city which awards the annual prize. The European Union webpage talking about the Pope receiving the Charlemagne Award, of course, Charlemagne being the one who was crowned by another Pope way back on Christmas Day in the year 800. Roman Catholic to the hilt and the workings of the Roman Catholic Church together with a European leader in the past. And the Pope gets his award at the present day. Another quotation, and this time from the 31st of August 2003, and reported by a leading Catholic news agency on the internet called Zenith. Quotation. John Paul entrusts the future of the new Europe. To Mary. He placed Europe in Mary's hands so that it would become a symphony of nations committed to building together the civilization of love and peace. Last Sunday the Holy Father urged the final draft of the European Constitution that it should recognize explicitly the Christian roots of the continent as they constitute a guarantee for the future. End of quotation. The Pope insisting that the Christian roots of the European Union be recognized. What does the Roman Catholic Church mean by Christian? we simply have to go to her official decrees because she explains clearly what she means by Christian. I quote from a very famous recent document published by the Vatican on the 5th of September in the year 2000 called Dominus Isus. It makes it clear that this idea of the Christian roots is just a facade. Catholicism means the Catholic Church and that alone. Her mind is expressed in that document, quotation, she condemns, quotation, the tendency to read and interpret sacred scripture outside the tradition and magisterium of the church. Anyone that dares read their Bible outside the interpretation given by the church, she condemns them. And then she says officially for the whole world to hear, quotation, therefore there exists a single church of Christ which subsists in the Catholic Church, governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. And so for Rome there exists one single church. And she says that is the Catholic Church. And just as the Nazis declared non-Aryans to be non-human beings. So now in this official decree, Rome declares other churches to be non-churches. Quotation, 
from this document. The ecclesial communities which have not preserved the valid episcopate and the genuine and integral substance of the Eucharistic mysteries are not churches in the proper sense. So this church and any church that doesn't have a valid episcopacy and a sacrifice of Christ in the Eucharist and an adoration of Christ in a wafer is not a valid church according to the Roman church. She is absolutely clear in what she says. And so her looking for the Christian roots is looking for the Roman Catholic power and roots in the European Union. Rome's mind is expressed and clearly expressed in her teaching. And she plans again to bring Europe under her control. Even secular newspapers in England and elsewhere are quite conscious of the mind of the Vatican. And I'd like to quote from the Sunday Telegraph in London. Quotation, the Pope is calmly preparing to assume the mantle which he solemnly believes to be his by divine right, that of new holy Roman emperor reigning from the Urals to the Atlantic. Sunday Telegraph newspaper in England, July the 21st, 1991. And I could give many more quotations. Even secular newspapers saying that the Vatican's mind is reign in Europe. Now this reign is not simply in publishing decrees, but it is in implementing her law through the civil law of a nation. And so this is what she thrived on in the past, in the dark and middle ages. The control that she had during the more than 600 years of inquisition against believers and the growth of her system was through civil law that she had implemented with kings and with princes of old. And by keeping people in subjection to her deceptive sacramental system that for salvation you look to Holy Mother Church and the seven rituals that she has. And it was this control that she exercised for more than 600 years in massive torture and in the death of many millions of true Bible believers. Her ambitions in Europe at the present day in the European Union is just a sequel to the control she already has in most of the European Union nations that are already part of the European Union, including my own Ireland, but also in those that are coming in to the Union. She has already absolute control, for example, right across Poland. And so, just as in the past, she brought kings and princes to heal by her commands and dictates and her laws, she now brings nations 
under her control through civil law. In the past, she could and did remove people's oath of allegiance to their sovereign leader so that they were freed from their allegiance to the civil power if the civil power did not obey them. Such was her power. And since the 20th century, we have seen a strategy that is quite similar to the preparation in which she prepared for those centuries of torture and of persecution. And so we have a pattern, just as before she got many kings and princes to sign on to her legal agreements. So, particularly in the 20th century and in her own century, the 21st, she is again very strong in her bringing in her power through the civil law of nations. She does this primarily by what is called a concordat. A concordat is a civil agreement made between the Vatican and any particular nation. It guarantees the Roman Catholic Church with the right and freedom of her type of worship. It includes defining of things like doctrine, the establishing of Roman Catholic education and hospitals. It includes property rights, appointing of bishops, and the recognition of the Catholic law over marriage, particularly of the Catholic annulment. Such agreements have been made in the 20th century and some of them really famous. Concordates in Latvia, 1922, Bavaria, 1924, Poland, 1925, Romania, 1927, Lithuania, 1927, Italy, the famous one with Mussolini, 1929, Baden, 1932, Austria, 1933, Germany, the same year, 1933, and Yugoslavia, 1935. The Vatican has preferred to do its civil agreements with its own dictators who are also Roman Catholic. And some of the most famous Vatican concordats or civil agreements have been made between the Vatican and dictators, for the most part who were despots, who ruled Catholic nations. And I'd like to give you some of the more famous of these. Those who were Roman Catholic of the Catholic's own fold, that the Catholic did civil agreements with. Adolf Hitler in Germany from 1933 to 1945. Benito Mussolini in Italy from 1922 to 1943. Francisco Franco in Spain from 1936 to 1975. Antonio Salazar in Portugal from 1932 to 1968. Juan Perón in Argentina from 1946 to 1955. And Ante Pavlik in Croatia from 1941 to 1945. Each one of those nations has horrors all of its own. what happened through these civil concordats in the 20th century. 
It wasn't simply the millions of Jews, but the believers that suffered also under Hitler. And what the believers suffered under Franco and Mussolini, and probably the most gruesome torture to believers and to the Orthodox in Croatia has been some of the more horrific massacres and torture ever known on planet Earth under the civil agreements that the Roman Catholic Church had with anti pavlik in Croatia. Make your stomach turn even to read of them. The Vatican is also it, involved in multilateral diplomacy, that is, relationships with governmental organizations that are not nations, and there are many of these. She has influence and official position with the United Nations and its agencies, the Council of Europe, the European Communities, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Organization of American States, and such as the Organization of African Unity. They're just the principal governmental agencies where she has strong influence. She also participates in a long list of international, intergovernmental organizations. And it would take me about a half an hour to read out the whole list. Immense amount of organizations such as the Unification of Private Law, International Council on Grain, Inter-Communications um, communi by Satellite, and many other agencies where you would never expect that the Vatican is involved in. She has a foothold not just in governmental agencies, but intergovernmental organizations. It was prior to 1989 that the Vatican mostly dealt with the European nations in concordat and civil agreements and ambassadors, and mostly dealt with the Latin American countries of South America. But she now has civil agreements with most nations of the world. Some of these agreements of old still continue, like the agreement concordat that was hammered out and recognized in law between Pope Pius XII and Hitler, signed on July the 20th, 1933, where the Vatican gave its approval to the Nazi regime and never went back on her agreement, though millions of Jews suffered and millions of others. She gave her approval to the Nazis, and they approved of her law, and even things of money coming to the Vatican through civil agreements. And then Hitler was Catholic, and so were all the main men in his deadly machine that massacred right across Europe. Fifty percent of the armies and air force of Hitler were Roman Catholics. The Vatican maintains civil relations with most nations on earth. And I'd like you to hear a quotation from Zenith, the official Vatican news agency that gives out official decrees and what's happening in the Catholic world. And I would urge you, in keeping track of the Vatican, that you keep track of Zenith, quite easy to find on the Internet. She said on June the 20th, 2000, under a heading, Virtually 
all countries have signed concordance with Rome. This Zenith agency said, quotation, the desires of countries around the world to maintain stable relations with the Vatican is greater than ever. This is reflected in the extraordinary number of concordats that Rome has signed with other capitals over the last few years. From 1950 to 1999, 128 concordats were signed between the Vatican and different states. This figure was disclosed during an international congress organized by the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, which has presented in one volume all the concordats signed over the last 50 years. In the past nine years, 43 concordats signed between the Vatican and other states. In part, this significant figure is due to the fact that with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the former communist countries hastened to establish diplomatic relations with Rome in order to change the church's illegal status. This has led other nations of the Middle East, Asia and Africa to knock on Rome's door and enter into judicial agreements. This marathon has implied an average of 19 concordats a year. End of quotation from Zenith Catholic News Agency. Now it's not simply controlled through these concordats, but she has also influence through her papal nuncios. Papal nuncios are usually archbishops, sent out as a civil ambassador to a nation, like we have papal nuncios to the United States of America, officially recognized in civil law. It is not only the USA, but 171 other nations besides the United States of America that as papal ambassadors. And usually the papal ambassador is the chairman of the Council of Ambassadors because he claims to be the oldest state. So he is usually the one who chairs the meetings of all the ambassadors together. The Vatican is one of the few states that maintains diplomatic dialogue with such countries as Libya while maintaining relationships with Israel. And with the exception of places like China, Korea, and Vietnam, where it is difficult for her to have civil agreements. It is still noted that she has always had agreements with Havana, even through the difficult years. With Islamic nations, there are still some nations that have not signed on with the Vatican of those nations controlled by the Muslims. Through her many civil ambassadors and her concordats with these nations, Rome is now quite ready to show her muscle again in bringing civil law to bear on believers. She gains much control through civil law and we are amazed at how graphically and in what detail she fulfills what the Holy Spirit said in the written word of God through the Apostle John in the book of Revelation chapter 17. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul or to the Apostle John, vividly depicted the features of this apostate woman. They are sharply cut and in precise detail. The Apostle John beheld the seven-horned beast carrying a woman dressed in purple and scarlet, 
decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, a harlot and the mother of harlots and abominations, revealed as the paramour of kings and a Herodias of heinous craft, demanding the blood of the saints, an artful, merciless Jezebel, manipulative, deceitful and scheming and intoxicated with the blood of the saints. And where does she sit according to the Holy Spirit given to us through the Apostle John? Her abode is verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Lest speculation wander far afield, the Holy Spirit leaves us without any possibility of making conjectures. Verse 18, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigned over the kings of the earth. Without dispute, the city is Rome, sitting on the seven hills. Her name is on our brow mystery. There's no mystery about pagan Rome. Her colors were always clearly seen. But what is called Christian Rome, there is much mystery. And the book of Revelation clearly shows that there is a real contrast between the Babylon and the true bride of Christ. Babylon being a city and a woman and the bride of Christ being the new Jerusalem, the city that comes down from God. Her characteristics are clearly seen. Verse 5, I beg your pardon, verse 3, sitting on the scarlet-colored beast. The woman is seen sitting on the beast. That is, she controls the civil power. She controls and directs the civil power, and the end justifies the means. The political power is subordinate to the ecclesiastical power, and is necessary for the Pope's aspirations and objectives. And this is exactly as it has been right through history. It is the church power that has entered into legal agreement with nations and used the civil power for her own ends. The woman, the church, seated on the beast, the civil power. In the words of Lord Acton, she is the fiend skulking behind the crucifix. Established as a sovereign state, the Vatican you has such power in law and in national agreements across the world that it is absolutely horrendous and mind-boggling because she is a real small state and civil power, but the influence she has bears no proportion to her size. And she continues to be the power that she has always been the spiritual power seated upon the civil power. The woman rides the beast. And her inner character is graphically portrayed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, upon her forehead a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. She is called great because of the scale of papal influence 
and because of the multitude of kings, princes and presidents with which she has done business. This state church is indeed a mystery. She is an enigma or a conundrum even to people within her own fold. She truly is described as mystery. She is called Babylon because she is the exact antitype of the ancient Babylon in idolatry and in cruelty. Babylon of old was only a small miniature of her. She is Babylon the Great. And she has the audacity in her new catechism of the Catholic Church, this famous book, Catechism of the Catholic Church, published in 1994 to declare no one can have God as father that does not have the church as mother. That is her declaration. Paragraph 181. She is revealed by the Holy Spirit as the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. An example of her as Babylon the Great was October the 8th in the year 2000. John, Pope John Paul II consecrated the world and the new millennium to Mary Most Holy. This blasphemous act of entrusting the whole world to Mary Most Holy, of that which belongs to God alone, was a contempt and ridicule of the first commandment that demands and commands that we worship God alone. This entrustment of the world to the all-holy Mary, showing her ridicule of God's holy word and of her worship that is unholy. The traditions of Holy Mother Church bring into the worship of God the lives of frustrated, celibate men and women. And worst of all, the idolatry that God hates, the veneration of icons and statues, and even down to venerating bones of saints that she calls relics. And she encourages communion with the dead. The same catechism of the Catholic Church says those words, communion with the dead. And she goes on to say, in full consciousness of this communion, the whole mystical body of Jesus Christ, the Church and its pilgrim members from the earliest days of the Christian religion has honored with great respect the memory of the dead. Our prayer for them is not only capable of helping them but also making their intercession for us effective. Paragraph 958 and paragraph 2683. You are to commune with the dead, according to Rome. That is, in another word, the occult. The Roman Catholic Church is truly Babylon mystery religion. And she has persecuted the true believers throughout history. Her courts, first of all, tried men and women and children from over the age of 12, that they could be tortured and put to death, and then handed them over to the civil power to be dealt with. In the crusade wars against Bible-believing towns and territories, the Roman Catholic Church waged war against the believers. The Bible-believing Christians were tortured and finally killed by civil power so that the Vatican did her dirty deeds through the civil rulers. We have with us Wiley's History of Christendom, four volumes, and some of it makes gruesome reading to see just what has happened in the history of Christ.
Christendom. And so few believers nowadays even know of what has been the history, our history as believers. On our webpage we have a small section called History where I give some quotations from such as J.I. Wiley, History of Christendom. She is, in the words of verse 6 of Revelation 17, the one who is drunken of the blood of the saints and of the martyrs. The Crusades against the Albigenses, the Vaudois, the Waldenses, is replete with massacre and barbarity and horrendous torture. The hounding down of true Bible believers is documented in the pages of history of this state church. She is the one who in the middle of the 13th century under the famous Pope Innocent IV who devised the actual details of how torture was to be perpetrated. The popes wrote down the details of how torture was to be implemented. The famous decree by Pope Innocent IV, Exter Panda, in 1252. It stopped short of pulling off limbs and causing death. But so severe was the Vatican law that none of the inquisitors in the different nations of Europe that tortured believers or put them to death was allowed to change the rules without express permission from the Vatican itself. They decreed how men and women were to be tortured and children from the age of 12 upwards. And children could be tortured to give evidence against their parents. From the beginning of the papacy around the year 600 to the present time, I'm reading from John Dowling's history over a hundred years ago written, he says that by careful and credible historians, it is estimated that more than 50 million of the human family have been slaughtered for the crime of heresy by popish persecutors. An average of more than 40,000 religious murders for every year of the existence of popery. I have quotations also from the same book from John Dowling and that was from book 8 of his History of Rome. Some quite interesting history of papal persecution. It's not just Bible-believing histories, even Roman Catholic histories document the Vatican torture machine. The famous author Peter de Rosa, Roman Catholic, wrote of the atrocities of the Roman Catholic torture machine. Quotation, the record of the Inquisition would be embarrassing to any organization, but for the Catholic Church it is devastating. Today she prides itself with being the defender of natural law and the rights of man. The papacy in particular likes to see itself as the champion of morality. What history shows is that for more than six centuries without a break, the papacy was the sworn enemy of elementary justice. Of 80 popes in a line from the 13th century on, not one of them disapproved of the theology or apparatus of the Inquisition. On the contrary, one after another, added his own cruel touches to the workings of this deadly machine. End of quotation from the Roman Catholic author Peter de Rosa. The Dark Side of the Papacy, Vicars of Christ, published in New York, New York, 
1988. A woman drunken is a horrific sight, but a woman drenched with blood and drunken with the blood of the saints is one of the more horrendous things we can picture. And this is what the Holy Spirit has given to us in the pages of Scripture and showing in detail how she has drunk the blood of the saints. How can a true Bible believer not see the likeness that God has revealed in his word? What clearer description can there be of the working together of civil power with a spiritual power than the woman who rides the beast as depicted by the Holy Spirit? What clearer description can be given than her colors? The scarlet of her cardinals and the purple of her prelates, be they archbishops, bishops, or monsignori. Her name is blazoned on her forehead and her prolonged persecutions show that indeed she is the one that is drunk of the blood of the saints. But it is not simply that she has done this in history. She is again the one who is at this very moment making civil arrangements so that she can be in a position to bring real difficulties on believers. When I was in Slovakia in the year 2000, the Bible believers spoke to me with great fear. They said, the Vatican has just finished a concordat with our state, and now we fear that it will be the police that will come to our door to close down our small churches. And so we already see in France and some of the Spanish countries, some churches and radio ministries and things closed down in civil law. It's because of such civil agreements that the Vatican has. And I was really told this by the believers themselves, how fearful they were because they were very conscious very conscious that it was the other nations that had civil agreements where the Bible believers find it so hard to worship and so hard to own property and so hard to open schools and so difficult to set up printing presses and radio stations because of the Vatican control through civil law. And so this is not simply history. This is our own time and is becoming graphically more clear in our own time. The same Vatican that made civil agreements in the past is now making more agreements than she has ever done before. One of these concordats, one of the more famous, was the concordat made by Pope Pius XI and Mussolini. It was that that gave the Vatican back her civil power. She had been, like the believers saw, not just the woman of chapter 17, but the one who was wounded in Revelation 13, and the wound healed. She had been wounded when Napoleon's troops took the Pope off his throne. And then in 1929, under Mussolini, she was given back a civil state, 108 acres, of which she again continued with the agreements of old and with many more agreements. I would love that you would read, even from a Catholic author, of the doings of present 
in present time of some of the popes, particularly the secret history of Pius XII by John Cornwall, and that you would read this book, The Ecclesiastical Megalomania by John Robbins, showing the economic and political thought of the Roman Church, documented from our own sources. It is quite clear that she is the woman that re rides the beast. It is not just at the Inquisition that she claimed to have power over civil rulers. In our present day law, I'd like to quote from the American edition of the present day law of the Catholic Church. Quotation, it is the right of the Roman pontiff himself alone to judge in cases mentioned in Canon 1401 those who hold the highest civil office in a state. Canon 1405, present day Roman teaching. And then while she can judge even civil power, she emphatically says in Canon 1404, the first sea is judged by no one. She is not to be judged by anyone. It is really sad that so few will even make any, any type of search to see how she is the religious power controlling civil power. If you want to make a search the way that I have put this paper together was simply by going to Google, the search engine, and typing in things like concordat and finding out the different concordats of Rome. Put in the Roman Catholic Church and the United Nations. Type in the Roman Catholic Church and the European Union and see for yourself she does not hide her political intrigue and it can be found quite easily. And you can even see many of her legal agreements on the Vatican's own webpage. She is quite clear and the world loves her and bows down to her and wonders and has adoration towards her, as the Word of God explained. The Word of God reverberates throughout the world and echoes back. The cry of revelation, come out of her, my people, and be separate. And be not partakers of her sins. If there is even one Roman Catholic, know that it is for you to come out of her and hear the word of God. And she is already condemned and her destruction is already written out on the pages of Scripture. Revelation 19 verses 1 and 2. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and had avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. The Word of God already speaks about her destruction. It says, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation. This is the clear teaching. This is what Bible believers of old have seen. From Dante, right through Savonarola, through all the men of the Reformation, to all the great men of history, from Spurgeon to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones to such as John Bunyan. 
all Bible believers have always seen and have always depicted the woman riding the beast. And for our own day, how can we not warn true believers? And how can we not be prepared to be ready for the day of judgment and to be ready as the true bride of Christ clothed in the garments that are clean as we have washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb and trusted on him alone. Now if there's any here, even one who does not know the Lord God, the All-Holy One, to know that we are commanded to trust not on any religious system or any church, but on a person. In the words of Christ Jesus, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. It is God's work. It is his grace. It is a finished work. It is complete. A perfect life. A perfect sacrifice. Trust on the person of Christ Jesus and know that eternal life and the joy unspeakable and full of glory, that you may stand firm even if persecution comes, that we are conquerors always through the blood of the Lamb. And we praise him that we will stand and that we will be able to give honor and praise and glory to him and that we will have an ability to warn others. There are very many sincere, devout Catholics all around us. It's to give the good news to them that there is a person, Christ Jesus. There is a person to trust and a person who is faithful. And forsake the woman clothed in scarlet and purple. Forsake the system and trust on the Lord. And then together in the same Lord we can forever praise him as we do each day as we're conformed to his likeness, giving praise and worship and glory and honor unto the one God in Christ Jesus now and forevermore. Amen and amen. amen. Praise God and praise God. Thanks for listening. If the Lord touches you, we'd love to hear from you. Visit our website at www.bereanbeacon.org. Goodbye and God bless you.